I probably don't need to explain why. I will give you some background, though. Here's a woman who's had 38 number one singles and sold 300 million albums worldwide. And along the way, she's been fantastically provocative, got up people's noses and sometimes been a bit difficult. So shortly, I'll be going to London to speak to Her Royal Majesty. After that, a treat for you, something we shot right here in the studio. A couple of guests who I just know that the Queen of Vogue, the material girl, would absolutely love. But first, here's Madame X. This is a dress that looks good standing up or laying down. But not sitting. Yeah. It looks great. We can lay down and talk. We could. It's going to make for an unusual shot. Yes. We're good to go? Good. Okay. We're going? Yes. Madonna, welcome to interview. My pleasure. And thank you for the champagne. Cheers. Very classy. Here's to your new album, Madame X. Thank you. Uh, I have to start with the eye patch. <laughs> of course. How did you... Uh, the eyesore. How did you get... To the eye patch. How many different things did you think about or try on before you got to that? Um, I didn't think of that many things. I just thought about world's most glamorous eye patch. I hope so. I hope I hope the whole world will start wearing them. <laughs> the, um, the irony of all of this is that I've actually covered up all of my eye patches now are the left side. And this is my weak eye, so I can barely see you. You're just, you're just a blur to me. Well. If it'll help you, I'm about six foot two. I'm uh-huh. blonde. I'm, I'm ch- chiseled. I can see Jordan. you're devastatingly I, I, handsome. I am eye candy. <laughs> that's, that's essentially what I am. Yes. This is how I like it. <laughs> the Madame X persona um, has all these different identities that you talk about. Yep. A professor and an equestrian and a housekeeper and a prostitute and a head of state. Mm-hmm. Are these creations or are these part of you? They're both. They are ways that I've felt, things that I've done. And it's also my, my point of view about the marvelous and wonderful and magical things that a woman can do. And you could be a head of state and you could be a prostitute and both of them have there's something to admire about both of them. There's an art to all of those things. And one job isn't better than another. And all women that do all of these things should be applauded, respected, and admired. And if that's what they choose to do, and um, I feel like I am all of those women. And I'm also... um, paying homage to all of those women. And I have felt nun-like and saint-like and I've felt like a student and I've been a teacher and, you know, I can teach the cha-cha and I know how to ride a horse. Um, so uh, I've lived the life of a nun, minus the, ha- the habit. Uh, and the chastity. And the chastity, yes. Other than that perfect oh, nunning. No. Everyone goes through periods of time where they're not having sex. Come on. That even is true. You, even you. Uh, uh, how can you even tell? Even you, you devastatingly handsome creature. Your eyesight really is bad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this is how I like it. This is excellent. Okay, the, just keep drinking the champagne. Uh, indeed. So the nun identity, that's yeah. interesting because in uh, a couple of the clips, Stark Ballet and mm-hmm. also Medellin, yeah. uh, there's that call back to the Catholic iconography which you've had throughout your career. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like a prayer, the most memorable with the burning crucifix. What is it about the imagery of the church that draws you back? The idea of sacrifice, suffering, prayer, um, faith. There's something um, really extreme and dramatic about the idea that, you know, I mean, in any church you go and you see a man on a cross, practically naked, bleeding from his wounds, and everyone genuflects and Mm. prays to him. I find that so intriguing and poetic and sometimes sexual, sensual. And the idea that people are 
in a way, it's pagan. <laughs> because people are worshipping a thing. Mm. And that's what pagans did. And that's what Christianity was against, paganism, because they worshipped the earth or the sun or the moon or the stars or the trees or the animals. And in Hinduism, they worship statues and, you know, um, uh, sorry, I'm, my Hindu deities are escaping me. That's all right. No, it's not all right. Vishnu. Vishnu, that's one. Shiva. Shiva yeah. um, Hanuman. Uh, wait, no. Who's the elephant god? Hanuman. No, that's the monkey. The elephant god. The overcomer, Ganesh. Ganesh. Ganesh mm. The overcomer of obstacles. Yeah. Yes. So some people would say that's paganism, but Hindus believe that each of these gods took on these manifestations, these physical manifestations for spiritual reasons, and you get certain energy from it. So I wonder, that part of Christianity and religion fascinates me. I'm not sure everyone's thinking the same way I'm thinking. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, the idea that an object uh, has the power you endow it with, which, exactly. is, which is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Your album is a, a real global tour. You've, uh, you've worked with artists from uh, Colombia and France and Portugal and America. You've mm -hmm. styles from hip-hop and rap to fado and mm -hmm. reggaeton. Brazil? Yeah, Brazil as well. So you, you posted something earlier this year from David Bowie where he talked about for an artist to do something really exciting, they've mm -hmm. got to be prepared to go in uh, to, the to deep deeper end. water. Yeah, the deep yep. end. Is that how this felt for you? To me, it felt like a privilege to work with all of these people. I didn't feel like I was in the deep end. Um, I did feel like I wasn't sure where I was going per se, but I never planned when I moved to Lisbon to make a record in the first place. So in, in the beginning, I was just experimenting and having fun uh, without the pressure of having to make anything in particular. And then it just took on a life of its own. It's really interesting where you drew your influences from. Can you uh, describe to me some of the living room Sessions? Sessions you were invited to in Lisbon. Yes, well, the first time, um, I mean, I, I lived in Lisbon for a while, for a couple of months, and I was really consumed with my, my children's life, my domestic life, putting them up and putting them in school, get, getting David started in soccer academy. They were going to the Lycee. They had to learn how to speak Portuguese. Um, and the Portuguese way of life is very different than the American way of life. Uh, and I, you know, it's a Mediterranean country, People are much more laid back and enjoy life in a way that Americans don't, but also don't have the same work ethic that Americans have. So there are pluses and minuses. And so I was, you know, and I was also living in a house that was 500 years old. So um, nothing ever worked, including the Wi-Fi. Um, so we had many challenges and I spent a lot of my time putting out fires. And then I realized I had no social life and I didn't have any friends. So by chance, uh, this woman named Victoria that I had met in London years and years and years ago when I was filming Evita, I met her, she's Colombian, and she had moved to Lisbon. And she invited me to this um, gentleman's house and she said, oh, we're, darling, you must come to the living room session at Leonardo's house. Simply must come. It's simply so divine. You, I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to love it. So I said, okay. Um, and you can't just sit in your house all day with taking care of children. Um, so I went to this house and people were sitting around drinking wine and music was playing in the background. There's a big grand piano in the room. And I sat down and in about 10 minutes after I got there, two guitarists got up and started playing music and a photo singer started singing. And the, the music kept changing and the musical influences were changing. We were listening to flamenco music, we were listening to tango, we were listening to jazz. I mean, it was all over the place and everybody was unbelievable, like incredible musicians. No one had any kind of um, inhibitions, no kind of formality. It was like the most natural thing in the world, and I was blown away by it. Like, what are the chances of that happening here, for instance, or America? Was it, it a nice for you to be able to just melt into that and not be? It was amazing. Madonna? I was just, I was just one of the people there, and um, and 
the view of the sea, you know, the doors were open to the view of the sea and it was just a magical evening and that turned into many other magical evenings and other people it turns out hosted living room sessions so I got to meet lots of people and go into lots of different homes and small bars also photo bars bars where not only um, musicians played but painters painted and I just thought wait have I swallowed a pill and fallen down the rabbit hole like what's happening like all this artistic outpouring and creativity and like nobody knows about it mm -hmm. what a beautiful way for you to get to know get Lisbon Genesis, yeah. and also to meet people can you tell me about the the night you uh you met the orchestra I don't Batu know Batucaderas yeah. yeah well on one of those living room sessions I met a musician named Dino de Santiago who was from Cap Verde he knew I was looking for inspiration so he said I've got a real treat for you I'm gonna plan this evening you show up at this place don't ask, again don't ask any questions so uh, I went to this small club and I sat down and a DJ was playing and I thought okay what's so special about this and then suddenly the music stopped and the crowd parted and then there was sitting in a circle 22 women sitting in chairs wearing white turbans on their head white blouses and colorful skirts. And they were all playing leather drums on their laps called dechebas. And they were beating out a triplet rhythm and they were singing in Creole um, songs about freedom fighting, about rising up, about slavery, about n not bowing down to fear. And of course I was very inspired by them and eventually I collaborated with them and I made a song with them called Batuka mm. and that's on my record. I'm sure you've heard it. Yep. I noticed that uh, your son David had a, a credit on Batuka. Yes. Well, all my kids are singing on it, <laughs> yeah, but David are. in particular asked for a credit. So. Wow. That. What does that say about David? Um, he's. Um, he thinks highly of himself. Hmm. And. He plays soccer for Benfica. That's what happens. But you would. <laughs> you would applaud that, would you not? Of course. I. I I don't have a problem. If Esther, Stella and Mercy had asked for credit, I would have given it to them as well, but they couldn't be bothered. <laughs> Impressive at, at 13. People kissing and touching each other and, and, and the music was insane. And You also say, Madame X, that she's a, a freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that you fought in your life and which you've been honoured for is for the rights of the LGBTQTI communities. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could do that thing you do in Medellin where you say, I'm going to go back to when I was a teenager and naive. Can you describe to me that night when your high school ballet teacher, Christopher Flynn, mm -hmm. took you to a gay nightclub for the first time mm -hmm. and what that opened your eyes to? Um, well, I really had no idea what it was in store for me. It was just, you know, he could tell that I didn't fit in and I didn't have a lot of friends in school and... Um, we became very close friends and he said, I'm going to take you out and you're going to have fun. You need to have fun. And um, it was like being born again, really. Just a whole world opened up to me. I saw people in a different way. I saw people not caring what other people think. I saw joy and abandonment and um, confusion. <laughs> Uh, and boys dressed like girls and girls dressed like boys and people kissing and touching each other and, and, and the music was insane and the dancing and the disco ball. And I mean, I'd never been in a place like this before. So it was, a, it was an eye-opening experience. It was a magical experience. It gave me hope that there's a place in the world for someone like me and... Yeah, that was that was the beginning of a of a beautiful future. Yeah, I mean, you've carved mm -hmm. such an extraordinary place for yourself in the world. Mm -hmm. I know you've posted online lots of really beautiful videos of your children performing. Mm -hmm. you know, Mercy, yes, they like piano. to do that. They do, but there's a lot of talent in there. Yeah, how do you help them to eventually grow out of your shadow? Well, um, I think they grow up watching me do what I do, they know that it's a job, that it's my job, that I'm an artist, 
and that I don't just sing and dance, that I'm also a political um, activist, that I fight for the rights of, of marginalized people. Um, they know we go to Africa every year um, and they are very much involved in a lot of my philanthropy. So for me, it's really important that they understand and they stay in touch with who they are and they have a view of the world that is vast and broad and that they understand that we breathe a rarefied air and that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what they do in the end. It just only matters that they are, you know, um, compassionate human beings that treat other human beings with dignity and respect. And, you know, if they decide to become singers or, or dancers or art painters or soccer players or whatever, they see, they've seen how hard I work. They know that I didn't make it the easy way. They know that I earned everything I have and they understand that if they want that, they also have to work for it. And being um, my child isn't necessarily going to make things easier for them. Um, but, you know, David, for instance, the first year that he went to Benfica, um, he said he could tell a lot of the other students were um, testing him and giving him a hard time because I was his mother. But he just kept playing and kept staying, you know, focused and didn't get, let anybody, anybody's bullying get to him. Mm -hmm. And now in his second year, he's considered a leader on the team and people look up to him and admire him. And, you know, you have to fight for it. But I, had to, I didn't have famous parents, and I had to fight in my own way. So we all are born with a test. You famous do, parents are not. You, do you are not going to get a word in edgewise. Okay, sorry. No, Go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> Just kidding. Cheers, that's all right. No, Cheers. I don't need to. You're the person I'm here to listen to. Okay. You do work incredibly hard. I saw some footage of you uh, rehearsing your choreography earlier uh -huh. this year. It was <laughs> remarkable to watch. Where does your work ethic come from? Is it the dancer's discipline? It comes from dancing and also, I would say, the Catholic Church. Really? Yeah. As in sacrifice? Yes. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet you're always poking the Catholic Church in the eye. Well, we always hurt the one we love. <laughs> <laughs> the thing we love. Pretty you can't have a champagne with the Pope. One day he might invite me. I think this one might. You think? Yeah. That would be an interesting meeting. Yes, what well... Would, what would you want to say to him? I would say let's talk about... Um, let's talk about Jesus' point of view about women. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you really think he thought of women? And don't you think Jesus would um, agree that a woman has the right to choose what to do with her body. Just, I think he would be, uh, I think he would be open to having that conversation with me. I wonder if the people around him would be open to letting him have that conversation. They're gonna have to leave the room. <laughs> Fair enough. You said a beautiful thing about your mum last year. You put up a picture of her and you said, I hope I've been able to carry the torch for you and that you're somewhere mm -hmm. smiling and proud. Mm -hmm. Um, because you didn't have a mum as a role model, she died when you were little. Mm -hmm. How have you charted your course as a mum with six kids? Oh, just really um, putting one foot in front of the other. And, you know, getting advice from my sister who had children before me. What was and my the best friends. advice she gave you? Um, you're going to learn from all of your mistakes. And there's no rule book to being a good mother. Um, so much of it is about instinct and accepting the fact that nothing's going to go according to plan. Because <laughs> you said that the, your kids have taken you down roads you'd never imagined. Mm -hmm. What's been the most beautiful part of that? Where's, where has the road taken you that you never expected? Well, Lisbon, very good example. Mm. My son took me to Lisbon. I didn't go there because I wanted to go there. Mm. And look what happened. We're having this conversation because of my son. When I went to Lisbon, I had no intention of making music. Um, and then somehow it ended up happening. 
And I, and I owe that to my son. It's hard to imagine mm. you, as you described yourself at the beginning, kind of lonely and locked in a house. That's not how I imagined well, you. Well, I wasn't locked. Well. I could get out, but there was nowhere to go. I mean, you have to know people to know where to go. Mm. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not like going to go out by myself. But I figure you have people who will find you people if you need people. What, people finders? People finders, yeah. No, I don't have that. Seriously? People finders? No. Well, you know, I mean, hey, Madonna... No, no, I'm very old-fashioned. Really? No, you have to meet people organically. You can't send people out to get people for you. What kind of a life is that? I'm leading the wrong life, clearly. You are? Do you have people finders? No, I don't, actually. I uh, have people losers. Oh, OK. <laughs> I have those, too. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, your choices uh, are really interesting. I like the fact that you take risks, though. The performance you did at the Billboard Awards where you did Medellin, where right. you had all the holograms of yourself dancing. Yes. That struck me as uh, quite groundbreaking and a very, very difficult thing Time to do. Time-consuming. How confident were you when it came to the moment that that was going to work? Um, to the last minute, in fact, at 2, two o'clock in the morning, maybe it was 4 a.m., I don't remember, the producers of the show said, you know, we couldn't get the technology to work. We couldn't get the time code to sync up with the, um, the virtual personas. And so they kept popping up in the wrong places. And it was something that was really unpredictable. One, one run-through, it would work. And then the next run-through, they would appear not on top of tables, but somewhere else. Huh. They took on a life of their own. And so everyone was really worried that that was going to happen live. And so they said, let's just pull the plug. We can't take this risk. And I said, uh-uh, we're not doing that. We're taking the risk. We're, we're going to, let's do one more test and we'll decide tomorrow at 10 a.m., because they had this technician that was going to come in who was determined that he was going to fix it. So we waited until the morning, and he came in, and he fixed it, and thank God, because it worked. I was, we put so much work into it, I was not going to give up. Do you stay calm in that situation, um, or do you go... Um, uh, uh, let's say an agitated calm, mm -hmm. a mild hysteria. Oh, I think that's quite <laughs> reasonable. Yes. <laughs> Be more daring. Be counter. I up with um, where we started with Bowie. He, ha he said a beautiful thing that um, he sees ageing as an extraordinary process mm -hmm. whereby you become the human being you're always going to be. If that's right, what kind of person do you feel you're becoming? Um, hopefully I'm becoming a more compassionate, intelligent, creative adventurous, curious human being. Because going back to the freedom fighter thing, you yeah. say that one of the things you say you're fighting now is ageism. But it seems to me that's your sweet spot where you get to push back on other people's expectations. Well, I've always been doing that, though. That's mm. nothing new. I've always been criticised, no matter what age I was. So does so... a part of you enjoy, enjoy the fact you've got to fight? No, it would be nice to not... It would be nice to just talk about my work sometimes without having a label put in front of my name. You are the label, though. Yes, I suppose. Yes. But a lot of people have a lot of preconceived notions about who I am, and they would like to limit me with other labels. And I think that's what's so interesting about this album, mm -hmm. uh, is that um, it came from such an unusual place... Mm -hmm. or a, group of places, mm -hmm. and you're not allowing yourself to limit yourself at 30 years into your career. And why should I? So I've got some sense preparing for this interview with the gigantic enterprise that's required to launch a new Madonna album. Gigantic. Gigantic. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to go on a tour as well. Is there a Netflix and chill Madonna just where you relax? And... I can't wait to the next season, the new season of Handmaid's Tale. Very Just exciting. to cheer yourself up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just to to, to, to... to let myself see the world we're almost living in. A dystopia yes. and chill. Yes. <laughs> really? But uh, will you allow yourself just to sit around? Uh, well, I don't watch? have a lot of sit-around time, but I do enjoy watching films. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And the kids, yeah. uh, that incredible age range... Um, you know, one of the things you describe yourself as, one of your identities is housekeeper. Mm -hmm. That's me. I don't see you as housekeeper. I don't... Oh, I have OCD. 
Really? Oh, yes, I can't stand unmade beds and messes in rooms and lights left on. Nope, messes left in kitchens. See, that's what children are for, to clean up the messes oh, in kitchens. Oh, no, really? They make them. <laughs> no, 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 you've got it the wrong way round. I do, but I tell them to clean up after themselves. They don't listen to me. Mm, OK. I, I'm getting the wind-up signal here, but uh, just before we go, because you are one of the most stylish people over the last 30 years... Ew, thank no, you. It is very true. You must uh, be wearing an eye patch too. <laughs> no, but even you can even carry off an eye patch. Just some advice mm -hmm. as how I would turn this into something a bit more stylish. This is what I have to work with. Colour would be good. A dash of colour. dash of colour. A necktie. I actually like neckties. Really? A pocket scarf. A matching. A different, maybe, who made your suit? Uh, some people in Sydney. OK. That's, you know, that well-known fashion centre. Right. I mean, be more daring. Be counterintuitive when you get dressed. Oh. OK. I'll put my pants on over my head next time and see how it goes. Why not? <laughs> Wear a skirt. There's a thought. <laughs> but, Anna, really lovely to meet nice you. To Thank meet you, you so much. Cheers to you. Cheers. And um, thanks for the tips. My pleasure.